Welcome to this video for the Blueprint of Life topic. This video is going to be looking at the following dot point. Perform an investigation to construct pedigrees or family trees. Trace the inheritance of selected characteristics and discuss their current use. So before we actually are able to create some pedigrees, we actually have to know what they mean, what the different symbols and things mean in pedigrees. So a pedigree is, as it says in the syllabus dot point, it looks very similar to a family tree. And every pedigree has a certain number of uh, shapes, a certain kind of shapes that are the same across every single pedigree. So we can see here that whenever we have a square, we have a male. So we have a male here at number one. We have a male here at generation two, number one, and a male here at generation two, number three. Then our females are circles. So we have a female here, a female here, a female here, and two females at the bottom here. Now, when we're looking at different characteristics, since you know we're looking at genetics, we need to look at how different characteristics are carried from generation to generation. When a individual's uh, shape is colored in, then that means that they are affected. So they are carrying the trait that we're looking at. If there is a single line joining a male and a female shape, this shows us that those two have been mating, that they've undergone a sexual relationship and they have produced offspring. So the line that comes down from the middle of that joining line is shows uh, takes us to the next generation and shows us the individuals that are born to that couple. They're in order of age. So individual one is the oldest, two is the middle child and three is the youngest. So this couple here has had one male, then they had a female and then they had another male. Then this youngest male here has also had a mating relationship with female number four and they've had two female offspring. If the lines come from the same point on the offspring line, then we have identical twins if they're joined by line between them. And if we have uh, the the two lines that look a bit like cherry stalks, but there's no line joining them in the middle, then we have non-identical twins. And obviously you can't have identical twins if one's a male and one's a female. So when we look at different pedigrees, they're able to tell us a lot of information about a particular trait. So this here shows us the way that we can tell if a trait that is in a particular pedigree is autosomal dominant. So autosomal means that it's carried on one of the 22 chromosomes that doesn't determine our sex. Okay, so it's not on the X or the Y. And as we know from previous lessons, the dominant characteristic is the one that has the dominant allele. So it will overshadow the recessive allele. So an autosomal dominant trait includes the following features. Both males and females can have it. All affected individuals have at least one affected parent. Transmission can be from fathers to daughters and sons or from mothers to daughters and sons. So when we have a look at sex linked uh, situations a little bit later, we'll see that mothers can really only pass the characteristics on to their son. Uh, sorry, scrap that. We'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> so once the trait disappears from a branch of the pedigree, it does not reappear because that means that those recessive alleles have uh, come into every individual within the trait. So therefore, we'll never have a dominant LL that overshadows the recessive trait. In a large sample, there will approximately be the same number of males and females that have the trait. So some examples include Huntington's disease, achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism, and neurofibromastosis, which is the elephant man disease where people have uh, uncontrolled swelling of particular parts of their body. So if we have a look at the pedigree up here, we can see that there's roughly equal number of males and females affected, that all of our affected individuals have at least one parent that is affected. And over here, we can see that there were no affected individuals in generation two, therefore generation three and beyond, unless one of these people here marry a person with the uh, trait, then we won't pass that characteristic on to future generations. Then we have autosomal recessive. So again, autosomal on our non-sex chromosomes, recessive being our recessive alleles. So the following features allow us to tell if a uh, pedigree or is showing an autosomal recessive trait. So again, both males and females can be affected because we're not 
uh, impacting the sex chromosomes. Two unaffected parents can have an affected child. So that means that uh, both parents have one of the dominant alleles and one of the recessive alleles. And so when they reproduce, they're passing on both of those recessive alleles to one of their offspring. All of the children of two people with the conditions will always show the condition because remember, autosomal recessive, there's no dominant allele in there to overshadow it. So if you have two parents with the trait, then all of the individual offspring are going to have that trait as well. The trait may disappear from a branch of the pedigree but appear in later generations. Again, that's because of the uh, recessive trait can be masked by the dominant trait. So the condition may disappear, but then you have two heterozygous individuals come together, have a relationship, produce offspring, and those two recessive alleles can come back together again. So over, over a large number of pedigrees, again, there is approximately equal numbers of affected males and females. So that's the one there. There's two ways really that you can um, tell if something is an autosomal trait that we have approximately equal number of males and females uh, with the trait and that both males and females can be affected. So some examples of autosomal recessive traits include albinism, where people completely lose the pigment in their body, so they look very white. Cystic fibrosis, which uh, we looked at a little bit briefly, where uh, there's a buildup of mucus in the lungs and also red hair colour. So now let's look at some sex-linked characteristics. So we look at them relating to the X chromosome. So X-linked dominant pedigrees have the following features. A male will pass the trait on to all of his daughters and none of his sons. So males have one X and one Y. So if a male produces daughters, then they have to pass on that X chromosome to their daughter. And because it has the dominant allele, that daughter will automatically have that X-linked dominant trait. For the same reason, males cannot pass it on to their sons because males only pass the Y chromosome onto their sons, not the X, and the Y doesn't carry the characteristic. A female with the trait may pass it on to both her daughters and her sons because both will have an X chromosome. And then uh, even if the, the female offspring gets the uh, X recessive chromosome from her dad, it doesn't matter. She's already received the dominant chromosome from her mum. So every person has at least one parent with the trait. Okay, so there's no getting away from this. There's no skipping a generation. If the trait disappears from a branch of the pedigree, it doesn't reappear. Again, because it is the dominant characteristic. Over a large number of uh, generations, there are more affected females than males. And examples include vitamin D resistant rickets and incontia incontinentia pigmenti, which is a rare disease that results in the death of affected males before birth. So X-linked recessive uh, pedigree. So these include the following features. All sons of females with the trait are affected. Why? Because if it's recessive, that means the mother has two X recessive chromosomes which means she has to pass on one to her son. There's no matching LL on the Y chromosome, so the recessive trait is shown. All the daughters of a male with the trait will be carriers. So if the mother has the trait as well, which we may not ha actually see, so the mother could be heterozygous, so she could have one X dominant, one X recessive. If she gets that X recessive from mum, then she's going to show the trait. But if she gets that dominant X from mum, she won't show the trait, but she carries the recessive allele on her other X chromosome, which she could then pass on to her future generations. So none of the sons of a male with a trait and an affected fem and an unaffected female, sorry, will show the trait unless the mother is a carrier. So again, that goes back to what we just said. If dad has the trait and mum doesn't, there's a 50% chance that the son won't have it, but there is also a 50% chance that he will if mum is a carrier. All children with two individuals with the trait will also show the trait. Again, if it's recessive, we always have that trait passed on with both individuals, individual parents. So in a large sample, more males than females will show the trait in this particular case because the males don't have the luxury of having an extra X chromosome to carry the dominant allele, 
like the females do. So some examples include one form of red-green color blindness, haemophilia and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So this is why there's a lot more males who have red-green color blindness than there are females. So this just shows a little bit of a flowchart of how we can determine what type of uh, condition is being shown in a pedigree. We'll go through this a little bit more in class, but this just sort of summarizes it quite nicely. So you just follow the arrows to work out to have a look at the the, uh, the pedigree itself and then that should hopefully be able to tell you whether it's autosomal recessive or dominant or sex linked recessive and dominant. We don't really look at Y linkage at this point. So most of the time you'll just end up with the purple, orange, blue or the pink sections. So let's have a look at a question to do with albinism. So it says albinism is an autosomal condition. So the gene is carried on chromosomes other than the sex chromosomes and it is recessive. Albino individuals have the genotype little a, little a and lack any body pigmentation of hair, skin or iris. A family pedigree for the condition is shown below. So we need to do three things. Work out the genotype of all individuals from one to five and determine what evidence there is in the pedigree to determine that albinism is a recessive trait and it is not sex linked. So let's start with looking at some key terms from the question. So albinism is an autosomal condition. So we've said that it's not attached to the sex chromosomes. It is recessive and the genotype that people with albinism have is little a, little a. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is work out the genotype of the individuals one to five. So individual one is colored in, which means that they're an albino. So from the question, we know that individual one is little a, little a. Sorry for my writing, it's not great. <laughs> uh, then number two is a square, so it's a male, but it's not colored in. Now, we have a look at the next generation to be able to determine whether he is uh, big A, big A, or big A, little a. So because we have individuals in generation two that are albinos, Individ excuse me, individual two must carry the little a allele. Because they don't show the, gen uh, the phenotype, sorry, they therefore must be big A, little a. Individual three is non-albino, so they're, they have normal pigmentation, but mum was an albino, therefore mum had to pass on a little a to individual number three, so individual three is also little a, little a. Now, individual four, if we have a look, is a normal male who had a mating relationship with a normal female. However, they produced an individual with albinism, which means both of them must have a little a in order to produce an albino child. So again, individual four is little a, little a. And lastly, individual five. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because it doesn't really give us much information. We would need to have a look at a mating relationship in the next generation to be able to really determine what uh, exact genotype individual five has. At this point, however, we can say that they are little a, little a, or little a, big a, because they can get both of those allo combinations from their parents, okay? Now, question B says, what evidence is there that the pedigree is uh, is a recessive trait. So remember we said that in a recessive trait, we can have two unaffected individuals have an affected child. So there we go. We can see right there that we have two uh, affected individuals and an uninfected, uh, sorry, an affected child. Okay. And the next one says, why or how can we tell the albinism is not sex linked? So this goes back to up here. So if it was a sex linked characteristic, mum number one would be X little a, X little a, and dad would be X big A, Y. Now, because we have a female who has albinism, she would have had to have received an X little a from dad to go with the X little a from mum to be an albino. So automatically we can see here that an unaffected dad has produced an affected daughter, which therefore means that we can't 
have albinism being a sex-linked characteristic. And we'll leave it there and we'll do some more examples like this in class. So thank you for watching.